Hi, Shoreline family. Welcome to week one of the Book of Ruth, the big message in a short story. We are so excited that you've decided to dive in with us over the next couple of weeks. Ruth is a powerful story intended to communicate to its audience the heart of the Old Testament. It's got a big message of hope, not only for its original audience, but for us as modern Christians today. So just to quickly outline the weeks to come, we are going to focus on the introduction to the series in this session. We'll look at why it's important to study our Bible, why we look at the Old Testament specifically, some best practices for studying our Bible, and then we'll hop into that first part of the book of Ruth. I'm going to ask you to follow along with me on your handout, which you can download at shoreline.church slash Wednesday nights at Shoreline online. But chances are, if you are watching this video, you've made it 99% of the way there. So go ahead and click that blue button below the video to download that. So that is this first session. Weeks two and three, we're going to look at the remainder of the book of Ruth. I've divided it into four main acts with a prologue and an epilogue, just like a play or a drama. Week two, we're going to look at acts one and two, and week three, we will look at acts three, four, and the epilogue. Well, before we get started, let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. We praise you for the way that you have revealed yourself to us throughout history and pursuing your people beyond what was deserved. We thank you for the ways that you are still working and moving in our lives today and pursuing us with the same fervor. We ask that you would be with us over the next couple of weeks, that you would reveal your truth through this short book and that it would impress on our hearts and we'd walk away changed. We thank you and we praise you in your precious name. Amen. Well, I believe that if you are watching this teaching video, you desire to know God more fully and you desire to know the Bible more fully. And I'm glad that you're here because the book of Ruth makes me so excited about reading God's word. It wasn't always like this, though. I'm very fortunate. I grew up in a home where I knew Jesus. I became a Christian from a very young age, and I can't remember a time where I didn't know Jesus's name. While there are so many wonderful things about growing up in the church, there is a little bit of a cautionary tale um, for kids with this story. A good friend of mine, she put it this way. She said, imagine a child who grows up exceptionally wealthy, never needing anything, never wanting anything, always experiencing the wonderful things that this world has to offer. And that is such a gift. But as this child gets a little bit older, the excitement, that same excitement gets lost a little bit. It begins to fade. You know, that is a similar story uh, or often the story of kids who, who grow up in the church. It's not always that way, but often, you know, their excitement and their love for Jesus in the Bible, it can become a little bit stagnant or even dull. They might have a hard time pursuing God on their own because, well, they, he's always been put in front of them their whole lives. They didn't really have to try. And friends, I've found myself here throughout my life uh, too many times to really count. I thought that I knew God. I knew every Bible story there was to know. <laughs> of course, that wasn't true. But in my mind, I knew the Bible. And there was still this aching in my heart. If I knew the Bible so well, why wasn't it changing my life? Why did I feel so distant from God? The truth is, I didn't know him at all. I wasn't pursuing him. I wasn't learning about him. I wasn't getting to know his character, what he cares about, what he loves. And we've been given the greatest gift, the gift of God's word written and recorded throughout history, penned by people who literally encountered God, whether it was through the burning bush or a voice in the middle of the night, or they received a foot washing from Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh. And when we read his word, we encounter him. That's how we get to know him. So I want you to think with me for a moment. Close your eyes if you have to. Think of someone who is super important to you. Someone you know like the back of your hand. Now, 
It could be a spouse or a child, a best friend, or maybe a parent. I want you to picture their voice or picture their face. Picture, think of the way that their voice sounds. I want you to think of a crowded place. So many people, you're not sure where your person is. Could you pick that person out in the midst of that crowd? Go ahead and open your eyes if you were closing them with me. My guess is that absolutely yes, you could pick your person out of that crowd. I was thinking of my sister Mandy, who probably knows me better than anyone on this planet. Uh, we are shared a room from the day that she came home from from the hospital and uh, to the day I left for college. And all I need to pick her out of a crowd is a short sound bite of her voice or her laugh, and I'm 100% sure that it's her. We have spent our whole lives together. I have watched how she listens to people, how she cares for people, what she's passionate about, what she wants to do with her future, all of the wonderful things that God has given her to, to change this world. I know how she responds to different situations. And that is a gift. The first fill in on your handout is to know someone is to spend time with them. Friends, it's the same way with our God. God desperately wants a relationship with you. He wants you to be so certain of his voice that you're able to recognize it without a shadow of a doubt. He wants you to know him so well that you're able to see how he's working and moving in your life and in the lives of others. And I invite you this month to really dive in to the Bible and experience the joy of getting to know God, spending time with him and listening to his voice. So that's why we study the Bible. That's why it's important because we get to know our God. But why is it important to study the Old Testament? Why would us as 21st century modern Western people place such a high value on studying English translations of ancient texts from thousands of years ago from the other side of the planet. My guess is that if you were to ask how many of your friends or coworkers spends time reading ancient texts from Mesopotamia, my yeah, yeah, none of them do. None of your friends do. So why do Christians do this? Why is there such a high value in pouring over these texts and and gaining wisdom from them? You know, It might be self-evident to you if you've been a Christian a long time or you've studied scripture for a while. You might not feel the need to make a case for reading the Old Testament. But I would argue that we do need to make a case for it because as we go on in this modern world, reading the Bible and the Old Testament specifically is going to be a habit that is going to become more and more strange as time goes on. So we're going to start this class on the book of Ruth with a New Testament lens, specifically about what Jesus says about these Hebrew scriptures that we're about to dive into. So grab your Bibles. You'll actually want to have your Bibles through the rest of this course as we'll be going through certain passages together. And I would love for you to follow along with me at home. We'll be looking at certain words and I want you to really see I want you, whether or not you have my specific translation. I want you to read for yourself. So open to Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 36. And as you turn there, I would love to set the scene for us. So Jesus has just risen from the dead. Amen. (laughs) And he's about to appear to his disciples. This scene actually follows a very famous scene uh, called the road to Emmaus, which is where two people meet the risen Jesus on the road They walk with him and they talk with him and they go away telling everyone that Jesus has just risen from the dead. But the disciples have not yet seen him for himself. They they just heard rumors. So this is where we pick up, starting in verse 36. This is the word of the Lord. While they were still talking about this, Jesus stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened. Thinking they saw a ghost, he said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do your doubts, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. 
And while they still did not believe him because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. I love this scene here because I imagine it being um, a very quiet room, and the only thing that you can hear is is Jesus, uh, you know, chewing on, on this fish. Um, and, it, you know, all the disciples are just staring at him, waiting to see what he's going to say next. Um, I also love this scene because it reminds us of Jesus's humanity, right? I mean, Jesus was 100% fully divine, yet he's also fully human. He's just been dead for three days. And so you can imagine how hungry he was, right? So he's eating this broiled fish and they're all staring at him. And this is what he says next. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. So Jesus basically gives them a tour through these Hebrew scriptures, and he's showing them that this whole set of texts is telling them a story that pointed to himself. And this is how Jesus understood uh, this, this whole uh, part of scripture, right? He's, this story, he uses a very specific word. He says, everything must be fulfilled. So this is how he understood it. This whole set of texts was pointing forward to himself and that something about that story needed to be fulfilled. Something was unfulfilled that he's going to bring to completion. And so he's explaining to his disciples I am the answer. I am the linchpin in this whole story. So what should the disciples gain from reading this whole set of texts, right? What what should we gain from these scriptures that they know so well? And he's going to explain it to him. This is the message. He told them, starting in verse 36, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So why do we read the Old Testament? Well, We don't read it because it's an interesting or fascinating story. And we don't read it because, well, someone told us that we had to. It's important. We read it because we are disciples of Jesus of Nazareth, the risen Messiah, the Lord of all creation. And as a habit of this this disciple, we get to know Jesus in the story that culminates in the Messiah suffering, dying, rising from the dead, you know, and and bringing this movement of the forgiveness for the nations of the world. So if I want to have any hope of following this Jesus, this risen King, then I have to understand the storyline in which that makes sense. So Jesus says that the storyline in which that makes sense is three quarters of our Bible that we refer to as the Old Testament. And that's why I think it's important. And that's why we spend time impressing these stories on our hearts. So there's two things that I would like for you to walk away with from this session. The first is this. As we open the book of Ruth, this 6th century Moabite woman has something to do with the coming of Jesus Christ the forgiveness of sins, and the ultimate bringing together of all nations on earth into one kingdom of God. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Reading your Bible is a habit that takes time and practice. It is a lifetime of poring over these scriptures, committing them to memory, you know, seeking wisdom from them, obeying what it has to teach us about our lives today. It's not helpful just to, you know, flip to a random page and, you know, read it and and try to figure out what to do next. There is a right way and a wrong way to read our Bibles. And so I'd like for us to establish some rules and guidelines um, before we get started. So 
I'm going to have you do some homework on your own in between sessions. And don't worry, it's not going to be a ton, but I would really love for you to put these guidelines into practice so that you're able to walk away with uh, this class, with the tools that you're equipped to read your Bible well, and you're able to experience life change from it. So I would say if this is your first time going through the Bible and you're trying to understand it as one story, I would say that you would read it chronologically. Start with Genesis and go on from there. Shoreline has a fantastic 50-day Bible reading plan, which you can download on our website right under the resources tab on the main page. It'll give you a couple passages to read every day, not too much, but it'll give you, you know, this, the story of the Bible and you'll be done in 50 days and you'll be good to go. Another resource I'd like to bring your attention to is our Bible book overviews. And they are, we have written one for each of the 66 books of the Bible. And you can also find that on our resources uh, tab on the main page of our website. It'll give you a summary of an author, um, key dates, theological lessons learned. And I love to start here actually when I go into um, a plan or a, a book uh, because it gives me some context about what's going on and, and reminds me where we're at in the whole story of the Bible. After you have selected a plan or a book to work through, it is time to follow some, some helpful steps so that you're able to figure out what's going on, what the text means, and ultimately how you should act differently because of what you've just read. So the first step in healthy Bible reading is called observation. And here are some helpful questions to ask at this stage. Here we go. Where does this text appear in the whole story of the Bible? Meaning, was this book written before Jesus or after Jesus? What's going on in history at the time this book was written? What does this passage or text assume culturally, economically, and or spiritually? Also, pay attention to what this book is saying about itself. What words are repeated? What's the structure of the storytelling? What type of literature is it? Is it poetry or narrative? And these are all helpful questions to ask at this stage. My suggestion to you is that read your set of verses or your chapter over a couple of times through to come to your own observations before you turn to a commentary or other evaluation. And this promotes healthy Bible reading on your own. You're able to learn how you interact with the text first. So that's the first step called observation. The second is this, it's interpretation. At this point, you're able to make a conclusion about what the author might be trying to communicate through this, through this passage or this text. I would suggest that you write a summary of what you just read. And at this point, you can turn to a commentary or ask a pastor what you think it means. So that's uh, observation, interpretation, and finally the last step, application. What does this passage or text have to do with me? How do I apply it to my life? If we're reading the Bible well, we should feel convicted, right? We should experience life change. It causes us to change our hearts and to live differently. And so those are the main steps for good Bible reading. And that was a very simplified version. So if you'd like to dig a little bit deeper, I would point you to last month's uh, Wednesdays at Shoreline online class called Bible Study Methods. And that's taught by Pastor Roy and his team of lay teachers. They go through very different types of healthy Bible reading practices and gives, um, gives you tools for how to read the Bible based on, you know, your personality type or um, just the level of intensity that you want to go with. Um, so there's, it's in between from very academic reading to more devotional reading. So you'll definitely want to check that out. On our Wednesdays at Shoreline online page, there is a button that says um, view our past classes and you click that and it'll open a playlist of all of our past classes. So I would encourage you to check that out. So here we are. We've talked about why it's important to study the Bible, why we study the Old Testament specifically, and some best practices for studying our Bible. And now it's finally time to open the book of Ruth. I want you to hold everything that we've just talked about in our minds as we open to the first chapter. So we'll start uh, 
Ruth chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and we'll read the first couple of verses, and I'll refer to these verses as the prologue. Like I said, I divided the book of Ruth into four main acts, like a, like a play or a drama, and we're going to see as the weeks come um, that the the, these scenes mirror each other in a really beautiful way, that these biblical authors, they knew what they were doing and, and the way that they structure, they're writing, they're communicating a certain message, and, and that'll become a little bit more clear in the weeks to come. So let's open Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. This is the word of the Lord. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malone and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. So let's pause for a moment. What do we observe? We're going to go through our practices. What do we observe about this section? Well, we're first drawn to the first line in the days when the judges ruled. What does that mean? Well, this is referring to a time in Israel's history where it was basically moral chaos, and it's all recorded in the book of Judges. The book of Judges it has it contains some of the most violent and gruesome stories of all the Bible, and it, sometimes it's, it's hard to stomach them, but it's trying to communicate that these people, God's people, God's chosen holy nation, they were so far from him at this point. So we're going to jump out. This is what the book of Ruth is doing, is we're going to jump out of Israel's story for a moment, this, great, this you know big storyline, and we're going to zero in on a very personal story of one family living in Bethlehem. And they choose to follow God despite, you know, Israel's moral chaos. So in the days when the judges rule, it's, it's this narrative detail is exactly why our English translations, our English Bibles, put the book of Ruth right after the book of Judges, because we try to understand things a little bit chronologically. But Ruth is actually, if we look back to the original uh, Jewish ordering of the Bible, it's, Ruth is found in the section known as the Ketuvim, the Ketuvim, which means that it's uh, wisdom literature. It's the same category as uh, Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. And so every book in this section, the Ketuvim, the wisdom literature books, there is a certain message of wisdom that we should gain. Basically, bi biblical authors are showing you, if you act this way, this will happen. So that's where we, where we pick up in Ruth. We're trying to figure out what the message of wisdom is. So let's continue on uh, back in verse 3. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they lived there about ten years, both Malone and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So what do we observe about this section? We observe very quickly that Naomi has just lost her husband. She has just become a widow along with her two sons. And like I said before, you know, the biblical authors, they knew what they were doing. So we read in verse 2, right, the names of her two children. I find this so fascinating. I don't know if, if you do, but I find this incredibly fascinating. Uh, the, the Hebrew names, uh, Malone and Kilion, if you look at the Hebrew, what, that, what they mean, Malone means actually to be sick or, um, or one who is sick, and Kilion means to be done or finished. So right after we read verse 2 and we pause, we know something bad's about to happen. The biblical authors knew it, right? They're, they're giving us a little clue of what's coming next. We also know, as, as lovers of God's word, we, we, our ears perk up at this detail that Naomi has just become a widow. In fact, the Israelite community had a plan in place for, for women in Naomi's position who, who just lost everything basically her whole family, her, her livelihood, right? Because women at this time in, in the world, they were, they were considered property. They couldn't provide for themselves. They, 
the Canaanite nations surrounding Israel would have just taken Ruth, or sorry, not Ruth, Naomi. They would have just taken Naomi and they would have, you know, enslaved her or left her to starve. And so we hope that the Israelite community follows through with their plan. In fact, God has a plan to take care of the community's most vulnerable. He he cares for his people because Israel was supposed to be this nation set apart and a holy nation different from their Canaanite neighbors. Moses uh, was actually given these community guidelines. If we jump back into Israel's history, after they've been delivered from their oppressors in Egypt, he brings them out of, out of this oppression and brings them to, into the wilderness, God does, and he gives Moses guidelines for how they should act. So let's jump back to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 24, or yeah, 24. And we're going to start reading in verse 17. And this is what happens. This is God's instructions for how Israel should take care of uh, widows. So we start reading, this is the word of the Lord. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That's why I command you to do this. So this is what he says. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheaf, do not go back and get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. So the Lord your God may bless you in all the works of your hands. God cares about the most vulnerable. He has a plan to take care of his precious children. So this is where we meet Naomi and Ruth. We, we are left on this literary peak. We're hoping that in the midst of this moral chaos, the Israelites still take care of of Ruth and Naomi in this vulnerable position. We, we pray that there's at least one person who is still faithful to God and his guidelines for how to live. We, we pray that they're listening to his voice and that they take care of these two women. But to find out what happens next, I will have you join me next week. Thank you so much for being here on this session. I hope it was uh, fruitful for you and I look forward to our discussion online via Google Meet. I'll see you there. Thanks for viewing the teaching online. Please join us for a time of discussion beginning at 6.30 p.m. To join, please visit our Wednesday Night at Shoreline online page on our website and click Join Discussion for this Wednesday night discussion on the Book of Ruth. We look forward to spending more time with you in deeper reflection and discussion. See you then.